We as a nation, viewers, are at a very crucial juncture of fighting this pandemic. We as a nation, we have responded very well to this emerging situation in terms of a lot of determination, in terms of a lot of discipline, and in terms of a lot of urgency as well. And the government at the same time is doing everything possible, firming up each and every effort, whether you talk about medical fraternity or testing capabilities and much more. And today, uh, on this uh, weekend programming, especially on COVID-19, we have a very, very special guest uh, joining us live all the way from uh, Geneva. And we're going to talk to her about the big picture as uh, joining us live on COVID-19 is Dr. Soumya Swaminathan, Chief Scientist at the World Health Organization. She's there with us. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Doctor, to be with us, Dr. Swaminathan, uh, for joining us live all the way from there. In fact, uh, before I come to you, let us also share uh, some more uh, points of uh, your body of work, the merit till recently. In fact, as we have her on our screens, please. She was the WHO's Deputy Director General for Programs. Uh, she's also a pediatrician from India and a very, very globally recognized researcher on HIV and tuberculosis. And also, uh, Dr. Somenathan brings with her 30 years of experience in clinical care and research, and, and she has worked throughout her career to translate research into impactful programmings. And Dr. Swaminathan was also secretary to the government of India for health research and DJ of the ICMR from 2015 to 2017. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for taking our time for Doordarshan. And at the same time, I'm also going to introduce other panelists on the show. Uh, Professor Dr. Puneet Mishra. He's uh, from Department of Community Medicine from, a from Ames, joining us here in our DD studio. But I'm going to come to you, ma'am, first. Uh, First things first, your overall assessment as we stand today in terms of numbers. Uh, do you think that we have done pretty well so far in terms of containing it at this stage, that is stage two? The challenge initially, you would agree, was to, was, to, was to confine this to stage two and not to progress to stage three? Or would you say that we are still in some sort of gray area? Thank you very much for having me on the show. I think India acted very proactively uh, right from the beginning. As you know, this is an unprecedented uh, outbreak uh, with a virus that we know very little about. And everyone has been learning as we have been going along and trying to adopt the best strategies. So in terms of the measures that were taken of screening and isolating and quarantining the travelers who were coming from the affected areas, I think that was done extremely well. and. All of our states have demonstrated that they can really do contact tracing, quarantining, hmm. and follow up extremely well, even compared to some of the high income countries that I have seen. Now we are in a different phase where it's okay. not just the travel related infections, but it's beyond that. And the data that's coming out with expanded testing is showing that the percentage of people who are turning out to be positive is still low. You know, it's still okay. around three, four, five percent not 30-40% that you're seeing in the European countries. And similarly, in the surveillance that was put in place by CMR for the pneumonia cases, there again, the positivity rate was, you know, 2 to 3%. So I think these are very encouraging signs showing that we have picked it up at an early stage, that strict measures have been put in place to further control the transmission of this outbreak. And that a well thought out plan mm. is now being rolled out in every state in order to make this into a sustainable and a long term strategy. I yes. think the lockdown has, has given that yes. little bit of extra time to ensure that this can go on for okay. many months. Dr. Swaminathan, we will talk about exit strategy in a bit, but uh, before that, uh, you know, you've had extensive research and uh, you've done lots of papers uh, in terms of tackling such emergencies, uh, such situations. Uh, many would say that South Korea responded to the situation at the very outset very, very efficiently. But then at the same time, not really drawing any comparisons, the world is looking at the way uh, India has uh, dealt with the situation. So I would want to know from you, ma'am, our viewers would want to know, uh, first of all, lessons, can we learn some lessons from South Korea the way they did it? and avoid so the I, mistakes that U.S. did. Yes. So I think public health and basic principles of epidemiology 
are very important to follow. This is an infectious disease we learned very early on that every infected person could infect another two to three people and it spread through droplets, which means that you have to be either in close contact or it is through, you know, touching objects and then touching yourself. So what needed to be done and what South Korea did and what India has done also is firstly diagnosing the cases because unless you know where the positive cases are, you cannot put in place all the other measures like isolation, contact tracing, and, and quarantining and follow up, etc. So the first thing really they did was to massively scale up diagnostics. And I think they were able to do it because they also relied a lot on their private sector. They had companies that were able to scale up this RT-PCR technology, build kiosks and drive-in centers for people to go and test it. So they just started testing, you know, tens of thousands of people so that they could find everyone, every individual. The second thing they did was really go after outbreaks. The, the same thing that has happened in India also, there was an outbreak there related, related to a religious congregation. And they, they had to track thousands and thousands of people uh, who had come into contact with the infected individuals okay. and keep them on follow-up for 14 days. So that also they did uh, very successfully. And I think mm. these were the basic, uh, the two things that were done right from the beginning is... Uh, diagnostic uh, so, so, for uh, everybody who had any symptoms. You, but how would you respond to the criticism initially? Or well, not really criticism, but, uh, uh, well, th there, were, there, were, there were some questions raised uh, on, on India's uh, capab testing capabilities and, and the opposition tried to rake this, uh, that why are we not going for mass testing, etc. Uh, do you think that was really required? And are you, are you satisfied with the way, the way we have ramped up our testing capabilities? We continue to do so. In fact, in the government briefing, we come to know that uh, almost on a daily basis, we are, we are uh, refurbishing our testing capabilities, more private players joining in. Are we well equipped? I think so. I think, you know, India has very good capacity in the public sector and I'm glad the private sector has also been brought in because there's extensive capacity in the private sector. So this is the time to involve everybody who has capacity, all government labs, all private labs. Now, the, the problem is, of course, that this is not a test that can be just done anywhere. You know, it's an RT-PCR, it's a molecular test. You need certain basic facilities uh, in the laboratory. So that is a constraint for many countries, not just India. Um, and, and which was why there was a little uh, slow to, to start. But then they've now it has been scaled. And I think the plans are to scale it even more. Okay. And that's only going to help. Okay. Let me have a quick word from Dr. Mishra. Do you first of all agree with Dr. Swami Nathan? And where do we stand today in terms of testing? Yeah, uh, definitely, I fully agree with uh, Madam on this issue. And uh, what I feel, India has adopted a very good strategy. Mm -hmm. I mean, initially there was, I don't think there was any use of testing each and every one in the initial stages. And uh, that was very much evident from the samples which were collected by ICMR in the cases which uh, those who have the SARI and other infections. And at that time, all the sample initially, the 500 samples, they were negative. So I think India, uh, I mean, time to time, they are changing their strategy based on the data and epidemiological evidences which are coming. Hmm. As Madam has already pointed out that the role of, you know, uh, the epidemiological evidence and the public health is very important in this epidemic. So uh, as, as the uh, uh, more evidences they have come, we have strengthened our capacity and we are planning to do more tests. And it, it, uh, the time will tell, I mean, if there's more requirement, we will do more tests. If there's hmm. no requirement, there's no use investing the resources. So I think the government of India adopted a very good strategy and uh, based on the advices of public health expert in the country. Hmm. So do you think that the exponential ramping of uh, our testing uh, capabilities is actually required to kind of uh, gauge the overall impact of the 21-day lockdown? I mean, as of now. Yes. Uh, doctor, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, the augmentation of this capacity, it was required and we are increasing it. Right now, the number of tests which we are doing, they are far less than the capacity which we have. And the okay. number of tests which well, we will be point. doing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Swami Nathan, in terms of uh, vaccine now, because uh, do you think there is also uh, a, a, a sort of threat or a challenge, uh, uh, this relapsing in near future? Uh, vaccine, R&D, that all that is uh, being underway. Mm -hmm. we, our doctors are working on war footing. What is the kind of threat or a situation we are looking at? Because this doesn't really confine to 
lockdown over and life limps back to normalcy. It's not like that. Would you agree? Absolutely. I think we have to all understand that this virus is here to stay. I think in the early stages, we were still optimistic that it could be contained, perhaps in some geographic areas, one or two or three countries, like SARS was, you know, SARS was contained in eight months. And it, it, SARS is also another coronavirus, but behaves a little differently. But looks like this virus is really here to stay now. It's spread all over the world. And um, it's very transmissible. It infects very easily. And so I think we are looking now at living with this virus. It's become another pathogen, just like we have the influenza viruses. We have one more. And so we have to find, think of long-term strategies. And the long-term strategy is really to, to have a vaccine that can at least protect those who are at most risk. And I would say healthcare workers is a group that's most at risk. And of course, the elderly and those who have other comorbidities. But the vaccine development, you know, normally takes anything from five to 10 years. Here, we're trying to accelerate it as much as possible. There is a lot of global momentum, a lot of research going on. But the earliest we can probably have a vaccine for, for use for the general public is about 12 months. And even then, we may not have the billions of doses needed to vaccinate everybody. So we'll have to collectively think of strategies of how do we protect those who are most at risk by vaccination. For younger individuals, actually, this infection is just like a normal uh, upper respiratory infection, like a cold and cough. It's not really that dangerous. The mortality rate is very, very low mm -hmm. in the less than 40 age group. So for them, they could develop immunity even through natural infection. So it will probably mm -hmm. be a mix of both. But it's really quite challenging for a government, a country, or a public health agency to assess the risks and benefits of how much uh, how strict you you know the measures you put in place versus the needs of people to you know go to work and carry on with their economic activities hmm. and so i think every country now is going to be having to find that balance of having a strong public health system in place where you're confident that you can take care of the patients who who get sick which is again a small proportion of all of those who get the infection are going to get sick and are going to need the hospital while we work together to develop a vaccine, and I think India will play a major role in okay. vaccine R&D. Uh, can, you, can you share, if it's possible, ma'am, a bit about, uh, on, on the lines, uh, the R&D, on the lines, what is being done uh, as far as uh, the vaccine uh, is concerned? Sure. So the WHO brought together a large number of uh, scientists and researchers from all over the world and also the private sector in February to start thinking about a vaccine. So we started this work very early into this pandemic. And what has happened now is that we keep track of what's going on. And we know that there are more than 100 candidate vaccines in development, some of them in academic labs, some of them in small biotech companies, some of them in the large vaccine manufacturing companies. Probably only two or three or four of these would be successful if we are lucky. You know, we still don't know if we will have a vaccine, but we hope for that. There are different platforms being tried from DNA vaccines and RNA vaccines, which are very new technologies, which have not really been used widely, to the known platforms like vac uh, viral vectors or inactivated virus or um, attenuated virus. So we will have a number of different candidates available within the next three to six months. We'll put together a panel of scientists, global panel, that will look at these and decide about some criteria that should be used to prioritize their further development. It's going to need huge investment in manufacturing. And this is where I think India comes in because we have vaccine manufacturers who supply vaccines you know, to half the world's population already, all kinds okay. of childhood vaccines. And so those uh, units could be scaled, manufacturing capacity could be built so that we're able to manufacture the, the billions of doses. Like I said, we we'll need billions and not millions of doses for this COVID vaccine. So, so that, and then there'll be policy and regulatory things to look at so that the regulators would need to move very quickly in order to you know, uh, license a new product. And there are certain complexities associated with that. But the main thing, of course, we will focus on is safety and, and, the, and the benefits of a vaccine to be used in different populations. Okay, uh, Doctor, would you want to uh, the yeah. wax on the vaccine front? 
Yeah, uh, as uh, Madam has already explained very well about the vaccine, the earlier uh, the estimate uh, for vaccine to come is around 12 months, as she has already quoted. And uh, many countries uh, they are working they are working on the vaccine. Mm -hmm. So uh, until unless the vaccine comes, uh, it's the only uh, the uh, I would say social uh, vaccine, which is the social distancing, frequent hand washing, and all these measures which we can take. I mean. Uh, the other vaccine would take some time, but the social vaccine is already available in the form of uh, you know uh, the measures which we are taking. And till then, we have to rely on this social vaccine mm -hmm. by uh, to prevent the disease. And uh, as he said that this uh, this virus is not going anywhere because this has so widespread virus. So what we want at this stage is that the progression should remain the slow. Okay. And the younger people they have you know some kind of infection. The herd immunity will take over, and then the vaccine comes, and then we can give the doses. Those those who require, especially the elderly people, especially the people who have the diabetes, the mm -hmm. cancer, or the diseases which decreases the immunity. So that way probably would be the best strategy to control the disease in coming future. So uh, Dr. Swaminathan, uh, taking a cue from what Dr. Mishra said, so we have to have uh, some sort of sustainable strategies post lockdown, whenever it happens, ma'am, because uh, in terms of social distancing, isolating, hand wash, etc. Uh, so do you think this has to be now part of our lifestyles in a certain way? I mean, yes. are we looking at I that situation? I, we are, absolutely. And, you know, this is true for people all over the world. In the Western world, for them, not shaking hands is okay. a big behavioral change. You know, and in Europe, uh, people are used to greeting each other by hugging and kissing each other on the cheek. So even here, people are really having to control themselves and, you know, make that behavior change. Of course, in India, we don't have that because we are used to doing namaste. But then we live in crowded environments. We live in unhygienic environments as well. Hmm. So I think there will have to be changes made in the office setting, in the informal setting. Okay. I'm particularly worried about our slums and uh, the fact that uh, people there need water and soap to really be able to wash their hands. I mean, we keep saying hand washing is the most important but we need to think about people who may not have those facilities, who may not be able to isolate themselves in a separate room, hmm. you know, if those facilities don't exist. So these are the kind of details we'll have to think about. And then we can use mobile phone, I think, to, I know that this Aroge Setu app has been launched yes. by the government. And I, because of the huge penetrance of mobile phones in India, I think it's a very good tool to use. Uh, because otherwise you're going to need millions and millions of people going door to door. So if you could use the mobile phone and an mm -hmm. app on it to track people with fever, to communicate with them, to tell them where to go for testing, to be able to also track all the contacts to find out where they are, whether they are sick, you know. In the US, I heard about a company that was able to track temperatures mm -hmm. across the whole country because they use digital thermometers and they were able to aggregate all the temperature recordings in the cloud okay. and Dr. they could Swami actually Nassim. see yes Ma'am, ma I'm sorry I'm interrupting you here. We need to wrap it up. But uh, before we do so, very quickly, uh, your thoughts, quick five points. Are we much ahead of the curve? A, B, uh, world is looking at India under the leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi and uh, we're being applauded for the way we have contained the situation. What do you think has worked for us as a nation? I think what's worked is that we have a strong history of public health, strong public health, you know, and I think it's been demonstrated and the director general of WHO, Dr. Tedros, actually said in one of his speeches that the world uh, looked at, was so surprised that India first eliminated smallpox and then eliminated polio. Nobody ever thought that India would eliminate polio and that we would be one of the last countries, but we were way ahead of many others. And this demonstrated that where there's a will, we have the way of doing it. We have the infrastructure, the administrative machinery okay. to go right down to the village level and do what, whatever it takes. So I think that's been clearly demonstrated in the past and we're showing that again now. That's, that's really our strength. The challenge is going to be to be able to sustain that. Yes while still allowing economic activity to resume, agricultural production to yes, resume, yes, you know, because right. people hmm. do have to earn. So that's going to be the challenge to achieve yes. the balance. But I'm sure that 
which will be possible. So we also have very good research institutes. Just the last point I want to make is that sure. we also have strong record of scientific investing in scientific institutions, mm. the CSIR system, the ICMR system, mm. the Department of Biotechnology, all the investments that have been made, you know, in in uh, in biotech in the last few years are, are right. actually now going to pay off. Yes, ma'am. So basically, the economic and human cost of lockdown has to be minimized as much as possible. Uh, many thanks for joining us. I'm sorry, we have that's that's all that we have for uh, for the time that we have for this edition of uh, special broadcast COVID-19. It seems that we all, as a nation, are working on war footing, Dr. Swaminathan. Uh, it's a long-drawn war, but uh, I think we are winning this battle every day. Thank you, both of you, Dr. Mishra and Dr. Swamiya Swaminathan, uh, Chief Scientist WHO, for joining us. And with that, uh, with, uh, from me and my entire team of COVID-19 Special Broadcast, thanks for tuning in to Doordarshan. Namaskar.